to How You Slice It. Uh, today we have uh, a guest who's really passionate about the pizza industry and aspiring uh, future operator and entrepreneur in the space, Miriam uh, Weiskind. Did I say that right? Of course. There's no, uh, there's no real wrong way to say it. Got it. You could just uh, call me Pizza Girl for short. And in New York City, people know who I am. Pizza Girl. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna make that. Uh, we're gonna make that a theme. I'm really excited about today's conversation. You have just such an incredible story, and one of the one of the most ambitious people I know in the space today. You know, just sort of your approach to it is with this uh, community first mentality, with this giving back mentality, and I'm excited to chat about that as well. But before we get started, just a quick quick intro on yourself. Yeah. Um, so my name is Miriam Weiskind. I am originally a small town girl from Dayton, Ohio. Flipped a coin in 2004, and it landed heads up, which took me to New York City. What was Tails? San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I had a I had a paying job offer there, and I did a non-paying job offer in New York City, but I did not mm. tell my parents it didn't pay. Yeah. So I had a garage sale, and out of the $800 I made, which is a lot to make in Ohio, I'm really good at sales. It's a lot. Um, it's a lot to make anywhere yeah, with yeah. a garage sale. And this is 2004, so I I bought a one-way ticket, and I took the remaining $600, and I found a room for rent with one of my oldest brother's friends, who I never met. I'd never been to New York City before, and I just was like, I'm going to make this work. And by the time I landed, I got one design freelance job mm. um, because my background is I, um, for the past 16 years, uh, was a, still am a creative director, um, and then I flipped careers for pizza. But that's what I came to New York City to do is to figure out how to make it big, quote unquote, in design. And what you later learn is that making it big in design is not a financial gain. It's about the impact you make with the design in the community you live in. So I love that. And uh, how exciting, creative director plus pizza. You yeah. could see how <laughs> how much magic is literally ready to be sort of uh, yeah. uh, launched with that. And uh, you know, you have this really contagious passion for pizza. Where did that come from? Obviously, you know, professionally, you're sort of a your your creative director, very creative mind. But when did your when were you originally introduced to pizza? And like, where did that passion come from? Uh, well, May nineteenth, nineteen eighty. My mom was in labor. Is, oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I was the gonna day. Say, I, why is that so specific? Yeah, because <laughs> that was the day that my dad and the doctor were eating pizza. My mom was in the longest labor. But the joke in our family was that I was popped into a pizza pan, and that is my. That was how I became immersed into the world of pizza. So. Um, my pizza has always been a huge part of my life and with my family. And when I made the, the voyage to New York City, um, it's interesting because it's, I didn't know why pizza was good, but I knew it, what good pizza was. Like I had this intuition to it with me. So, um, it wasn't until 2011 when I met Scott Weiner um, that everything sort of changed with how I was involved with pizza. Um, I mean, it's funny. I used to be the girl that would say, "Oh, if you're if you're gonna be on Bleecker Street, you'll see John's on one side and Keste on the other." May Keste rest in pizza in that spot. That was like an iconic place. Mm -hmm. But so these two pizzerias, and I'm like, "You got to go to Keste. There's no line." But once I started working with Scott, I later learned why there was no line. It's because the difference is, is that Keste, you're it's very fast in and out. Like you'll have your Neapolitan pizza. Maybe aperitivo, glass of wine, you're out. Also, it's like a 60 to 90 second bake. Now, John's is old New York style coal fired pizza. That's the kind of pizza you order pie and you have at least two pints. And also, it's iconic in terms of how long it's been around. So, there's a historical significance to it. So, there's going to be two very different types of people going into those places. Maybe in the one that would go into one and then go right into the other because why not? Why oh, not? wait, that's also known as a pizza tour. <laughs> Um, but so what happened was in 2010, I did the New York City pizza run, which is where you would run a loop around Tompkins Square Park, eat a slice of pizza, run a loop, eat a slice of pizza, run a loop, eat a slice of pizza. And in my case, after that final loop, I'd eat more pizza because uh, I think pizza by Sarté, which is, I think, the greenest pizza in New York City. That's right. Um, they were the the sponsor. So we were eating. I was like, and it's funny because the, the New York Times interviewed me. And I'm like, it's really hard to eat good pizza and run and not like, you know, throw it all up. But I never, ever <laughs> threw up any of my pizza. But so what happened was I won that year. They gave the female winner a pizza stone from pizza school. Mm -hmm. And they gave the male winner tickets to a pizza tour. And I'm like, wait a second. There's a pizza tour? How did I not know about this? I've been here for years. I love pizza. So I came back the following year. 
And after words with Jason, the organizer, he's like, equal prizes. I won my tickets at the same time I decided to become a freelance designer slash art director. I got my LLC and went off on my own. Mm -hmm. And um, Scott was looking to hire someone to help him with the tours in the city. He had one other person prior to that that helped him, but she lived in Jersey. Um, So at this point, he wanted to have someone to come on board. And he had interviewed a lot of people. But this the day that we met, it was at John's and Bleecker. We had meatballs and we had a pizza. And I'm like, this was this was like home slice love at first bite. So uh, he and I just clicked and he's like, listen, you might not know everything there is about pizza, but he's like, you know what good pizza is and you've got the personality for this. You know, I went on his tour. I'm like, how am I going to remember all this information? And I would sit there and I'd try to memorize the notes. And then I'm like, it's not about memorizing it. It's just about really understanding it because it would become my job to tell not just his story, but really it was the story of pizza in New York, the evolution and the history and the science and how it how I connected with it with it 16 strangers from around the world. So um, every Friday from 2011 until the pandemic, I led a public pizza tour and it was the best Friday of every single week. Best job in the world. Oh yeah, I call it the <laughs> best paid hobby on the planet. Um, yeah. And then later on I started to, to run the corporate events for him. Um, which was a little bit different, you know, you, you kind of, you're catering differently to the people there and, you know, you take them on a bus and you wine and you dine them and you teach them everything about pizza, but you have to figure out a way to connect with them because mm-hmm. they're there to like, I mean, they're not going to Nobu for sushi. They're going on a pizza tour because it's way more fun not to judge Nobu, right. but I mean, I am a hugely big fan of pizza. So I also trained his other guides and helped him build up the business, but for me, he'd always encouraged me to bake pizza. And I was like, ah, no, I don't need to. And it wasn't until, um, I think it was, I I was dating somebody and she had said, you're gonna go bake pizza at my boss's house in Connecticut. It's a wood-fired oven. I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to use this oven. <laughs> I mean, I'd thrown a piece of dough in a Caste's oven and be like, guys, watch how the dough, it blows up and then it comes back down. And then I'm gonna br- I'm gonna use it to brush this the hearth of the oven and get ash all over. I'm gonna serve it to you, and that's what the first pizza was really like, ash covered bread. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause you there for a second because um, I think not enough people appreciate the art of making pizza and how much of an influence or an impact the different components of making the pizza have on the final product. Yeah. One of those largest contributors to the final product is the oven. And there's all types of ovens. There's the coal-fired, there's wood-fired, there's the deck ovens. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch, but what does it mean for it to be wood-fired? What kind of product is usually sort of coming out of that oven relative to what you would see for a, like a traditional New York City pizzeria with mm-hmm. a deck oven? So if you retrace the evolution of pizza, really it starts over in Europe, over in the Middle East, anywhere where they were using a wood-fired oven to bake bread. Okay. And the way that a wood fired oven works is typically it's got one opening and it's a dome Mm -hmm. and the heat source is a convection. So being from the Midwest, I would describe to people, I'm like, as the hot air swoops out and the cold air swoops in, you get this tornado, but it doesn't blow the pizza out of the oven. Otherwise we'd all be there with our mouths open catching it. But the (laughs) idea is it's a convection. So it's going like this. That is how your heat, that is how the pizza is baked and your temperatures can get anywhere from 900 to probably 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's really hot, it's a Mm -hmm. very fast bake. Your flame is generally off to the side. Um, Whereas when you look at the first style of pizza that was being made in New York from the 1800s on up, they were using coal fired oven. The tenement houses were heated with coal. So those ovens are completely different. Um, They can be square or rectangular, they're lined with bricks. The coals are put into a chamber off to the side and your flume is in the in back, either left or right-hand corner. It's always opposite where the coal is. But when that oven heats up, the heat actually shoots across the oven. So it's not like a circular, not it's more all. direct across, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one signature characteristic that people notice about coal-fired pizza is you have these beautiful brick lines on the bottom. And I say, if you get a slice of pizza with a brick line, make a wish. It was one of my favorite things to do at Lombardi's and you'd always have that. a couple people in the group like, oh, I got the brick line. And like their whole day was completely transformed by the fact that they got the wish Mm -hmm. for the brick line. Um, But the baking temperature is going to be a little bit lower. You're going to be more in the six to 700 degree range. So you're looking at maybe a six to eight minute bake time, depending upon size and toppings. But that's what the very first style of pizza was for us. Now, enter the late 30s, early 40s. 
you have the gas deck oven introduced, which completely changes everything about the culture of pizza in New York. So that is when sliced pizza is born. If we retrace the footsteps back to when the first sliced pizza existed, I think Scott had it back to Patsy's Mm -hmm. in East Harlem. You know when you go to a Yankees game and there's a pretzel warmer? That is what the pizza used to be kept in. That's how you got a slice back in the day. Because you didn't put it back in the oven. It was too hot to reheat. So people would get these lukewarm slices, but that was it. Um, When we did the tour, there was a place called Pizza Box, which is now like four businesses defunct. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was an iconic place because I think that was the last freestanding slice shop in New York that was from the 50s. It was one of the first of the bunch, and it was the last to survive. And then it, it, I think it went out of business in maybe 2012, 2013. And so, since then, it's been a bit of a revolving door. Yeah, and there's no pizza in there. They turned it into a sandwich shop. It's like, oh. I walk by there, and I just am like, oh. Where, where is it? It's on, it was on Bleecker Street. Um, of it's course. <laughs> right, yeah, it's right by where uh, I think Percy's, which was formerly South Brooklyn Pizza, um, are over there. But but what happened, so the point was is that this is when sliced pizza is born. Mm-hmm. And you look at like after the depression, what could people afford to eat? Pizza was something that was very economical. And we live in an area where it, this, this is a pedestrian metropolis. We're always on our feet. And that's why New Yorkers take a slice. They get it heated in a deck oven. So the way that the heat source works in a deck oven is your heat's coming from two sides. All right, and then you have your brick that go, one, generally it's one or two solid pieces of brick that go across or stone and the door closes. So all the heat's trapped in, there is a vent, but the big difference between wood, coal, and a deck oven is a distribution of heat and temperature. So we know that if we're ordering a pizza from a deck, a place that has a deck oven, it's typically gonna take mm, maybe 10 to 12 minutes for that whole pizza to bake. They do give it a rotation in that oven because if you think about it, your heat's coming from two sides, you still have to rotate it to get that consistent bake. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you're going to get a pizza they didn't rotate, and one person's going to get the well-done side, the other person's going to get the doughier side. Um, But these ovens are great, and, you know, with in more modern times, what we learn is that those deck ovens lose heat. So, you know, you have Baker's Pride, um, you had Maestro, and then uh, Blodgett. Now we're seeing, um, I think, Empire just came out with the Mastro, which is a, it's a revitalized, revamped version of a gas stack oven, and it's phenomenal. It retains the heat. It's deeper. I was testing this out at Vegas for fun. Amazing. Um, but these ovens tend to lose a lot of heat throughout the day. So when people say, if I'm going to go get a slice, where should I go? And I'm like, well, and I went to a black tie event. And I'm like, I want to go to Joe's on Carmine, but only between the hours of 11 and 5. And I want to get a square and a wedge. Um, and the reason why is that the guys that were baking the pizza, they made the pizza the way I liked it. And also I knew that the oven w- had b- a better temperature range during it the time. It was still really hot, right? Yeah. If Whereas ever, later on in the evening, it starts cooling. Yeah. yeah. And like they have two sets of ovens in there, but it's just, it's different. I say that the two things that really define good pizza is going to be the quality of the ingredients you're using. And it's going to be the person baking it because no two pizza bakers make a pie the same way. Yeah. So. And it's uh, and that's that's the that's the beauty of pizza. Yeah, that's what makes it so so authentic. So so uh, going back to to sort of your origin. So you're in Connecticut. And, so I'm in Connecticut, yep. um, and I had no clue how to really use this oven. I watched a couple of YouTube tutorials. I knew what I had learned from the tours and from Scott. Um, Scott gave me a recipe for dough, and I thought at the time I was like, oh, I just made the best dough of my life, and so I was able to throw together some beautiful pizzas. And it's funny to look at the quality of those pizzas now, like now versus then, it's totally different. Um, <laughs> but I kind of got the itch. And then I'm like, nah, I came home and I'm like, I'm going to keep doing this. At home, I had two baking steels. Or no, at that time, I only had one baking steel. And this was relatively recent. Yeah, this was uh, 2019. Yeah. Um, and then I went through a breakup and I found that baking pizza in my apartment and inviting friends over was the best way to keep myself company. Um, and God, I remember the first time I made a Sicilian pizza, I had no idea what I was doing. And I took this dough and I just kept pushing it out and pulling it and I topped it and I baked it. I'm like, oh, it's raw. So we wound up ordering from, <laughs> we wound up ordering delivery from Ross Pomodoro, which I don't, they're not even there anymore. This is in the West Village, yep. but, um, they saved the day for us. But, um, what happened was, um, on January 1st, 2020, I went to a party uh, a New Year's Day party with some friends, and we did some image boards. And on my board, I knew 
that I wanted to trade careers. I wanted to pursue pizza more full time. Um, I'd already been designing a lot for um, different businesses within the pizza industry. Like I was the creative director for Joseph Campagna and Sons, and I still am, and this is, I think, 12 years and counting. So they would have me design pizza boxes and menus, and I'm like, this is like, there's so many pizzerias that need this. So I would offer that to them at a really great rate. And I was like, well, if I do that and I do Scott's corporate tours, I'm pretty good. And then I was like, well, maybe I can become a consultant of some sort. Because somebody, I was racing in Texas and these people were like, can we hire you to teach us to make pizza? And I'm like, sure. But I didn't know what I was talking about. I never took the job, but it gave me that itch. So what happened was um, I went around and asked a bunch of different pizzerias if I could get a job just to bake pizza. I wanted to learn. And I got turned down by a lot of people, but the one person <laughs> who said yes was Pauly e. G's. Yeah. So I wound up, well, the first night I was there, I fired up a pie. And he's like, listen, I, you know, I give you a job, a paid job if you want. It's not going to pay the way that, you know, as a, as a creative director, you're, you could be making upwards of $150 an hour. And it's, the restaurant industry is very different. Yep. And I said, it doesn't matter what this pays. I, like, I really love this. So I took a job with him a few days a week. Um, and I was balancing that along with doing the tours. And I found that getting behind the oven and making pizza really changed the way I gave tours for the better. Um, the pandemic hit. And I remember my last pizza tour was the day that Broadway went dark. Um, and I lost every job that I had. And I was suddenly like all other New Yorkers, uh, isolated and quarantined in my apartment fearing COVID. Um, and that was the point at which I was like, well, I need to still bake pizza. But then I ran into a problem where I was making too much pizza. And so my mom was like, well, why <laughs> don't one. you, yeah, I was like, I was like, well, dog, she only likes pepperoni though. Yep. But my mom was like, why don't you give it away? Like help people out. Like everyone in the building had lost their jobs. Um, so I put up a menu and I wrote on a pizza box that, hey, pizza is keeping me sane and happy. I'm baking a lot. If anyone wants a free meal. Like, here's a menu. Um, so my neighbors quickly caught on. Somebody outside of the building caught on. Um, they started ordering. And then I started documenting on Instagram. Um, and then I guess you should say, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> I went from baking myself two pies a night to four pies um, to the help with the help of a PR company that worked with Breville, donated um, some of their electric ovens. I went to 20 pies a night. Um, and this is all from your apartment? All from a, like a 250 square foot apartment. You're just like running a pizza shop out of there. Yeah, they, I call it a speakeasy. I didn't lower it from the window, but you would see people lined up outside. Um, at one point, there was a three-month wait for my Sicilian pizza. Oh, my God. Yeah, I did finally figure out how to make Sicilian pizza. Uh, and even to this day, I'm still perfecting, or as you said, crustfecting <laughs> the job. Um, but I wound up baking uh, before I took over a restaurant over 5,000 pizzas out of my apartment. And the whole thing with my pizza, and this was inspired by mo my mom, it was you know, to do good and help others, is that if you didn't have a job, if you were a first responder, or if you were just feeling sad or you needed to send somebody a reason to smile, they could come to my doorstep and I'd give them a free pizza. Over 5,000, no charge, all donated. Not all 5,000 were free. Right. But I baked over 5,000, mm -hmm. and I would say probably 30 to 35% of those were free. Amazing. People paid pies forward. Yeah. So that's how I was able to keep going. Um, because at the time, I was one of those, I think there were 300,000 New Yorkers that couldn't get any unemployment benefits. So I was in that group of people that for a few months had absolutely no income to pay rent. Yeah. Um, so that was a way that also helped me of out. Of course. Yeah. Um, and the Pie It Forward, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the Pie It Forward program <laughs> because this is a, a really big uh, initiative that Scott and team are, are running, I think in partnership with our team as well where there is an opportunity to donate to Pie It Forward, yeah. which then goes towards providing free pizza for the most part to um, you know, the most uh, sort of the, the areas that are most in need. So, so you're making pizza in the apartment, you start kind of perfecting the craft. Uh, by the way, before we, we move on with the story, uh, your Instagram handle is, so where can people follow uh, this story? They can find me on Instagram at the Zaw Report. So it's uh, the letter, you know, the, and then Z as in pizza. So the Z-A <laughs> in pizza, uh, Za Report. Um, and it's interesting because that handle, I intended to review pizza at one point, and it just became a chronicle of my journey in pizza. And now it's sort of become, it promotes my business, but I still 
very much are involved with um, a, being a slice of the community where providing people with lots of tips and tricks and answering questions. Like before I go to bed, I'm probably answering an average of 20 different DMs to give people advice with their dough or if they're using an uni oven or if they're wanting to get pizza in New York, where do I go? Um, so yeah. Um, and then one other really major part to my story that I didn't share yet. You know, I'd gained a little bit of notoriety. Uh, I get reviewed in the New York Times. Um, and then Vice came out and did a documentary about me. But in the process of Vice doing that, um, my parents who lived in Ohio, uh, both of them got COVID. My dad, he stayed at home. My mom wound up very, very sick, had to go to the hospital. And after five weeks, we actually had to let her go. Oh, no. Um, so she I'm passed sorry, away from COVID. Thank you. Um, so when people ask, they're like, you know, why do you always have four mom on the box? And even in the logo, you'll see that it's always there. Um, that's to pay tribute to my mom. And that's why I continue to give pizza out to help other people is because my mom did the same, not with pizza, but with everything else she everything could. Else. Yeah. And then um, recently someone was like, what's with the frog? Well, my mom's name is was Hyla, and it was the largest genius of frogs. So we always had frogs around to remind us of my mom. So you will always find a frog attached to the fur mom and my pizza. I love that. Yeah. That is uh, that that is incredible. And you know, you kind of are now taking this passion, uh, the lessons from running a pizza shop, a speakeasy pizza shop, and you launched like pretty awesome crowdsourcing campaign because we're now on a journey. Yeah. To launch a pizza shop, yeah, a full-blown brick-and-mortar pizza shop. I did one of the largest raises for a restaurant in the history of Kickstarter. Uh, I raised almost $100,000 um, with the help of the community and anybody that had been inspired. Um, and it was huge. It also, you know, I look at that campaign as it's important in inspiring other people in the restaurant industry to see what's possible with um, with crowdfunding and you know, that you can achieve the dream no matter how large or small it might be if you really are passionate about it and you believe in yourself. Absolutely. Um, and you now are taking this investment yep. and exploring options to to launch a pizza shop. One thing that's pretty fascinating that I learned even preparing for this conversation is uh, that there's only a handful of women-owned pizza shops in New York City. In fact, this number is declining. Yeah. As small as it is, it's actually coming down. On, on my on my page here, I have seven. Yeah. But before we started recording, you told me that it's actually less than seven yeah. now. And talk to me about the importance of that for you and setting an example, obviously, for for the rest of the community and like, you know, what sets you apart in the industry from other from other pizza makers? Yeah. Um we say the number, I think when I did a list and I you know, cross check between Scott, Adam Kubin, and a couple other people in the industry. We were only able to count seven, but it's kind of a gray area because what do you count as a as a pizzeria that's opened by a female? In my opinion, it's something that's not inherited. It's something that somebody has built from the ground up without the major support of partners or with any, without any men. So it's fewer than seven. And we also just lost uh, Johns on Elmhurst and Totono's. Totono's was, uh, you know, he was inherited by his daughter and then a cookie. And then you had um, Johns and Elmhurst, which was a, a mom and a mom and daughter. Totono's, I didn't know that it closed It down. hasn't reopened. It. Yet. I mean, that's an institution. That is one of the most iconic pizzerias in New York City. That's right. And I'm hoping that it's just a temporary thing. Yeah. Um, but you, you've just seen a huge decline in, you know, the, the smaller places being able to survive in this day and age because everything is different about pizza now. The culture about how we eat it, how we order it, um, even, you know, more people are baking at home. So a lot of these pizzerias and slice shops are having to jump through hoops and reinvent the wheel. I mean, you look at Pizza Secret and what Rosario would do, he'd completely reinvent his pizza in order to survive the pandemic. And it's still difficult for all these pizzerias. Walk but, us through some of those some of those adjustments pizzerias have had to make so and why. For a wood-fired pizza, it doesn't travel well. Right. Typically, it cools off in a few minutes, and people complain about cold pizza. Even Pauly G did not believe in delivery, but he had to do it during the pandemic because they had to be able to pay rent. They had to pay their employees' wages. They had there was a lot of overhead, a lot you to think about. So I know that Rosario um, and David uh, David Sheridan weeded another person, reinvented the wheel how they were doing pizza. Um, but they changed their pizza to adapt to delivery. So you're using different cheeses, you're using different mechanisms so that when that pizza is put into a box and it's sent out for delivery, that people are gonna get it while it's at the very least 
warm. It's a, it's a it's a better quality product that's delivered, but it means it needs to be different than it the product you're making in the store. Yeah, I remember when um, Roberto started doing delivery at Caste, I was shocked. I'm like, I I'm like I'd be so sad if I didn't get this hot. But it's the thing is that's a huge amount of revenue for those businesses. It's huge in this day and age. It's hugely important. Now I think one of the places that they sort of begin to suffer is when you have these third party delivery companies deliver for them. Mm -hmm. So um, you have like DoorDash, Uber Eats, um, Grubhub. Grubhub. Is it? I, I don't know how many times I've seen on Instagram somebody. There's a, a friend of mine, Mikey. He's like, I just got this pizza delivered, and they tipped the box upside down. And you just see all, and I think he, maybe it was like Emmett's, which is a very nice pizza to get delivered. And to see it like that is just heartbreaking. But you just see all the little Because squares. they have those bags that they put on the back yeah. and they'll just like slide the pizza inside like a book. Yeah. In a book bag. So and then, I'd know. have people, I'd have people order from the apartment yeah. and say, I'm going to send a delivery service. And I was like, no, I don't want my pizza traveling like that to you. It's going to get destroyed. Because like my Sicilian pizza um, if you get the smaller ones, that thing can slide. I can't afford a custom box yet, but right. like that thing will slide around everywhere. And I'm like, you're going to get the pizza and it's going to be completely destroyed and it'll destroy my art that I'm creating for you. So, um, but David with uh, Weeded, he's now doing, it's like, it reminds me of Sam's on Court Street. And there are only, I believe, two pizzerias in New York that make that style pizza. Uh, New Park Pizza and Sam's on Court, they have a coal-fired oven that's converted to natural gas, meaning they welded the door shut, they put two gas lines in, and you get this pizza that has that signature coal-fired crunch but that New York chew. So in comes David, who's like a huge bread guy. Yeah. So he was doing, I used to say, oh, he's making wood-fired pizza in an electric oven. I think, uh, I don't remember what oven he was using, but he just replaced them with some other company I don't think anyone else in New York mm -hmm. has. But he is pulling out some of the most banging pizza out of these ovens. And it takes you to one of those two places. Uh, he's such a smart guy. He had me putting, I think, Korean, a Korean cabbage kimchi on top of his cheese pizza. And I was like, really, David? He's like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, but I'll, I've been over there and I'll, I'll hang out with him and just make bread during the day. Yeah. Um, and just talk to him about experiences and, and learn. But um, he is, I think the pandemic was a gift for him and that it taught him how to quote unquote, pivot without poking fun at friends. Uh, pivot, pivot. So, <laughs> um, but it reinvented how he was doing pizza in the absolute best kind of way. And that is a pizzeria that I say, it's like, it's a hidden gem. You got to go out to Dipmas to try it. And also he has one of the most, one of the largest and best collections of scotch, whiskey, and bourbon in all of Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We're going to yeah. have to go check it out. Yeah, definitely. Is there a risk to pizza shop owners who have a premium product, in essence, in art? Because look, not all pizzerias are created equal. There's the pizza shops that are built for takeout and delivery, mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. They're they're made for off-premise consumption. You know, in New York, it's sort of the traditional corner, sort of New York-style pizza shop. And then there's like the masterpiece sort of locations, Pauly G's is an example. But when that product is changed for delivery, do you think there's a risk to the consumer, like to the shop, if the consumer's interpretation of the product is now different, what it would be if they were actually to go and walk in and sit down? Yeah, I think that it's all about what expectations are set for your customer. Um, there's always a huge risk. Your, your product is going to change the second it leaves your door. And that's why, I, you know, when I first decided I want to open a pizzeria, I was like, I'm just going to be like a 350 square foot like shop that you can take. You can take these wood fired pizzas to go. And then I realized after, you know, start taking over a restaurant, I saw the importance of people sitting down to eat the pizza while it was fresh out of the oven. Um, so what I do for events, uh, I'll ask people, are you taking this to go? And if they are, I'm going to slightly undercook it and leave it whole and set them up for success on how to put it in their oven when they get home so they can enjoy it as fresh as possible. So they can finish off baking. Yeah. 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 And there, there are pizzerias that um, that put instructions on the box to- Oh, wow. I think that that should almost become an industry standard to, to when you're placing an order for a pizza, uncut or cut and informing the consumer of just what that, what that means. Because you'd have a lot less people complaining about it. I mean, again, it was one of the, the issues that you- and Yelp is one of those things where I'm like, oh. people are like, I was, I did a podcast last week and they're like, you know, you know, reviews on online. What do you think about them? And I'm like, oh God, it's like the death of us. Like, 
if you have a pizzeria that just opens and, and you have a couple people that don't have a great experience because it's a new restaurant, like they should have at least six months of let us settle in before anyone writes a review. Yeah. So if you get a bad Yelp review or somebody goes on Facebook or complains on Instagram and that catches any kind of traction, that can really be detrimental to a business. But I know that like, you know, one of the things that Paulie struggled with when he was in delivery is that people complain about the pizza being cold. I'm like, it's wood-fired pizza. Unless right. you understand the science of cheese, you're not going to understand right. the science of how heat is going to work after it goes out, or I should say the physics behind it when it leaves the exactly. door. Exactly. Turning the page here, so you're you're about to embark on this journey to, to launch your own pizza shop. I am. Um, I want to cover a couple of things here. One is like, what are you most excited about in this search? I know you're exploring a couple of different areas and... You know, walk me through what your vision is for for your pizza shop. Do you have a name for it yet, by the way? Um, well, I just it's I probably the Zao Report, I should say. But okay, my whole thing is um so but so the logo uh is a girl running with pizza, and I also brought this for you. So these are my those are my pins for my Kickstarter. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. So I these say, will go on my suits. Yeah. So <laughs> the first logo, um, the running girl, that was actually I never expected to get to get to the place where I am today. So that first logo was actually um, another pizzeria in Brooklyn where I changed it to a girl because there were no logos that had women or girls. It was always a boy. Or, it's always like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have it here somewhere, but it's always I that, don't see like, any on the wall, chef, but yeah. that male. But, yeah. So the whole, yeah, it's the, the famous chef yeah. who's got the, so, yeah. um, you know, I did that logo as like, I want to make a point about women in pizza. And I know this is a much broader topic we're going to cover. But there are, out of the 2,500 pizzerias in New York City, we know that less than seven are owned by women, which is insane. Yeah. And over the past eight months that I've been, you know, working to open a place, I have encountered reasons why. It's just like you. What are some of those reasons? Let's get into it. Uh, I think there's definitely gender discrimination. Uh -huh. I think that people, uh, if I walk into a space and I sound like I know what I'm talking about, generally the the real estate broker and any, and there's always two people there. Um, when I'm looking, but they're like, oh, wow, she knows a thing or two. I was like, yeah, how big is the pipe for the gas? Because I'm going to have to rip that out and put a larger one in in order to get the amount of gas I need for my for restaurant. Heat, yeah. 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 I'm like, that's for res that's residential. So there are a lot of, or like when you ask questions about property tax, they're like, oh, you know about this? I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. I've been taught about these yeah. things. Yeah. So, or like how many, how many dwellings are in the building? Because like, I think it's over 10. The property tax changes so drastically. Right. And that can be huge for a business, or it could be a, a also break the business. Um, but uh, I think I've had a lot of experiences with real estate brokers who didn't take me seriously. Um, people who are like, oh, you'll definitely be your personal guarantor. And I'm like, no, I won't. Like, well, we won't give you this place. I go, then I don't want this place. Like, yeah. I know what that means. Yeah. Um, even the good guy clause, there's, you know, these are things we're talking about property. Um, I looked at places where people are like, we want 200000 in key money. And I'm like, for what? You're you're in debt. Yeah. Your your pizzeria is shut down. This equipment in here is worth pennies on the dollars. And the biggest problem is I have to actually redo what you did because it's a huge factor in why your pizzeria did not succeed. You remodeled it in a way that did not sell pizza. Yeah. You were selling booze in a neighborhood that didn't need booze. Yeah, like that's. So, um, I mean, that is one of the biggest problems. I'm, and um, I don't want to get away from the conversation of why there's such few uh, female owners. But one of the challenges that I that I think is facing the pizza industry in general, any operator, any any future entrepreneur, is the lack of insights and data about what the consumer or what the demand side of the business requires in that geography. Every geography is very different. There's yeah. different levels of income. There's different demographics. Some places are more family oriented. Some places are, are not. So many different factors that go into place, and time and time again, I just, I just kind of see operators doing what they would want themselves. But really, um, from a from both a pricing or product availability standpoint, how do you think about you know making sure that your shop is a good match for the community that you're going to launch in? Uh, so that's something I definitely want to cover, but I, I do want to get back to what are some of the other things you've seen from beyond just the real estate aspect that you think are contributing to such a small representation of female ownership? Um, I, you look at when I'm ordering pizza supplies, um, I'll get it, I'll get it spec'd out from three different places. 
and you can see who's trying to take advantage of you. And you'll say, you know what? I'm not going to pay this price per bag of flour when this person's offering to me for $5 less. Mm -hmm. Or you find out that that person is selling to a different pizzeria at a better rate. Um, and I, when I was in Vegas, uh, Nicole Bean and Leah Skirty from uh, Pizza Leah and uh, Audrey, they were all on a panel and they talked about the experience and the same thing. It wasn't until I heard them speak that I started to cross check what I was being charged for things and realizing I was being charged more. And why? And so, because I'm and a so woman? You're, you're exactly. And so you're now sort of starting from a much more difficult place than, than most people. Yeah. Um, having not owned a brick and mortar uh, has been a challenge. Um, and I know that there are going to be speed bumps along the way. And it's, how, it's about how you embrace those bumps and to, in order to learn from them. Um, but I know uh, there's a labor shortage. And one thing that I found is, you know, one of the most challenging aspects is uh, when you're hiring people, for them to actually take you seriously. Again, people are used to a woman in the front of the house but not back at the ovens. You know, in the pizzerias that I've worked in, and I worked in, I also worked in pizzerias in college and high school, mm -hmm. but it's just, I feel like there's always like the bros and it's it can be very uncomfortable for a female to be in that space. Yep. Um, and for me, I you know, I, I tend to blend very well with the men in the space because I'm like, I'm just here to make pizza. And, but the more you become aware of what's going on, you're like, oh yeah, the culture is not that great. And what I want to do with pizza is there are a lot of different things I want to do in order to to better the industry, to inspire people to think differently about how they operate and who they hire. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a handful of apprenticeships where I've traveled all around the country and worked with a lot of amazing people. And Jonathan Goldsmith at Spock and Opley is one of them. And when I learned that his employees had all been there over a decade, wow. it speaks volumes. Yes. When the dishwasher is making more money than your highest paid person in a pizzeria here in New York, I That's think right. that speaks volumes. And Absolutely. it's how do you choose to invest your time, your money, and your business back into your staff in order to survive? You have to. Um, so, you know, but when I came back, I just I from from Chicago, like my per my perception of everything had changed. And I know that I changed things about my process. I changed things about the people that I had hired to help me. And I'm currently looking for um, people to come work with me. And when you talk about community, as a pop-up pizza baker currently, I literally had another pop-up pizza baker come bake at a wedding for me. And there's there's something about the community, the love and the support that you get as a pop-up pizza baker that until you're a part of that, you don't understand what it is really like. So for me, I'm like, I've got this guy, his name was Kyle from Zellman's. And he's got a couple, he's got two little uni Coda 12s. Um, but I was like, I need a pizza baker. And so Sean, New York Slice, who was out in uh, Rockaway, he's like, I got a guy who bakes. And then Kyle's like, of course I'll come help you. And I'm like, this was the easiest event in my entire life because I could <laughs> trust you to not set my pizza on fire, to make sure they were cooked properly, and just to pitch in. And I feel like the reason why he was so great to work with, because he does pop-ups. He knows that like I'm doing all the prep. I'm, you know, getting everything to the event, setting it up, baking it, making it, baking it, and then breaking it down, you know, dealing with the clients. So like he understood where I needed help. And it was, it just, it was the least stressful event I've ever done in my entire life. Mind you, it also like monsooned last weekend. So That's we had right. to suddenly switch from <laughs> gas, outdoor gas ovens to indoor electric. Um, and you just have to be, you have to be a really good pizza baker to switch the ovens because they're totally different beasts. Yeah. What are some of the things that you believe need to happen in order to change the outcome of, of this sort of diversity gap in, in the pizza industry? Uh, with, uh, you mean with gender or? Yes, gender. Uh, I think that pizzerias, uh, in restaurants, I think they need to offer more opportunities to women in the back, like to be the chef or to be the pizza baker. Um, that we shouldn't be offered to do prep or to be the hostess. And one of the things that, at Spaca was that everyone that was working there had started as a dishwasher and worked their way up to yeah. get where they're at. Yep. And I think it's important for me as a business owner to instill that same philosophy that I want whoever's working for me to have experience doing every single job in the house. Because guess what? You're going to have people call out sick. You're going to have people that decide they're going to go on vacation for a few weeks and 
you're going to have to let them go, but you need to have other people who can step in and fill those roles. So I think that's really well said because I think um, not only in terms of diversity, but also in terms of like this labor challenge that's happening in the space across the across the country. And we see this every single day, even at, at Slice, as we talk to partners. One of the common themes is sort of this lack of access to labor. But is it really lack of access to labor or is it lack of willingness to pay? Uh, willingness to pay. <laughs> is 100% willingness to pay. Um, well, what's the advice you would well, give to a pizzeria owner who's struggling to hire like a pizza maker, as an example? And my advice to most people has been, hey, pay better. Get someone who will be strong, care about the business, care about their job, feel rewarded, feel like they're being fairly compensated. And sort of this whole challenge that people have about turning over, you know, workers kind of, you know, it goes back to this example where, you know, over 10 years in retention in in, in the team is is unbelievable. But 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 that's clearly driven by this operator's uh, empathy and sort of thoughtfulness around wages and taking care of their team. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't say it's 100% wages. I, I feel uh, the bulk of it is wages. But it is what the pandemic did to the, the hospitality industry is it sort of destroyed people's want to actually work for their money. Because we all were being given checks. They, oh, that's right. You were be. I was making more unemployment than I did in a pizzeria. I mean, Unbelievable. That's why you know a lot of these places lost employees, their labor, because and even even not even just the restaurants, going all the way to the distributors, the guys who were delivering my pizza supplies, they didn't have enough guys to drive their trucks. Yeah. Because those guys were making more on unemployment than they were being paid. But it's like, at where where do you actually budge? So. In my Kickstarter video, one of the things I talked about, which is very ambitious and it's still a gold mine, is that if I took investors, I'd retain 80% of my company. And I wanted to take between 10 and 20% of my profits, reinvest it back into my employees. The employees that stay for that full year, guess what they get at the end of the year based upon our performance? A really nice check. Like a dividend. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a stake in the company. Um, I think that the restaurants and pizzerias that open, and when I first did my PNL, I did it with uh, Vincent Rotolo with uh, Good Pie. When I first, when he, that was my, that was my donation from him. He's like, four hour boot camp, we're gonna do your PNL. He taught me everything, which for those that might not know it, PNL it's profit and loss. Yeah, it's a profit and loss statement yeah. that shows like your revenue and your expenses and the difference is your profit. Yeah, and yeah. you know that like your 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 payroll and your rent, like your rent should only be ten percent payroll, thirty percent overhead, thirty percent. So what you learn is that you know I'm like, well, what if I took less of a profit? Because I was seeing I was doing the math on what some of these other places are making. I'm like, where's all that money going? It's going in other investments. I'm like, why are these business owners trying to open? more places or invest in different places when they could take that money and just reinvest it back into their staff. And guess what? That staff stays with them. Most people that work in the restaurant industry will have at least two to three other jobs. So what if I could create a restaurant where those employees only had to have one job? They only had to work five days a week. And you know, when they get there, they get to have their family dinner. Their families come in, we feed them. So, but I, I really value the idea of the people that I hire don't work for me. They work with me. They are a family. And I think that when you have more operators that look at their business through a different lens to think, how can I really take care of these people and treat them like family? Only then are you going to see change with them. And also your customers are going to feel that energy. And they're going to want to support a company or a restaurant or a pizzeria that does that. Um, there's a place in Brooklyn, in Park Slope called Pasta Louise. And it's one of these few places you walk in and the staff's been the same from the start, mm -hmm. but they're taken care of very, very well. And yeah. it's a good job. I mean, think about this, uh, especially for pizza shops uh, and restaurants for whom delivery is a big part of their experience. If you're not treating the delivery driver well, and that delivery driver isn't feeling that same level of passion or, or love, um, and they're just like always upset or they're feeling like they are being shortchanged or they're being treated as like just another delivery driver. That is the 
a bookend of your experience from yeah. a from a restaurant owner's perspective. That's the bookend of your experience. And so imagine how that delivery driver is behaving or presenting themselves with your customer. Yeah. I mean, Spaka, those are does not use third party apps. You know what the third you know and you know what using those third party like Uber Eats, it's that can take 20% of your revenue. What if I just take that 20% and I reinvest it in my own drivers? Or if I have to use a contractor to deliver my pizza, let me vet and make sure that whoever I'm using is going to represent my business That's right. the way that it should be. Um, and you know, New York, it's like, I got on my corner where I live in Park Slope, there's at least 20 guys on the electric bikes out front. And I was like, I don't want my food coming from any of those dudes. Yeah. I'm tough. the person that goes, to, I go to the restaurant, I order from them um, or I'll order through their website just to make sure that like, even cause like if you order through website, they still are going to use other apps, but at least you know that that's the the app that they're using directly. And it's not like one of the other 10. Yeah. It's going to take another cut of another cut exactly. of another cut. So, but to give them as much money as I can and let them keep that. Awesome. Last question for you. Uh, let's fast forward like two years. Yeah. Just paint me a picture of the Zah Report uh, shop and, you know, what are you doing? Two years. I will have a wood fired pizzeria. Okay. I will also have a deck oven that gives, that has uh, Sicilian on uh, limited nights. Um, but it'll be a quaint, a uh, romantic place to come where you'll be able to sit down and enjoy my pizza. Um, I know you haven't had it yet, but one of the things I pride myself in is that uh, a lot goes into my dough um, and people never waste the crust. And that's because I, I go through a five-day process to create my pizza dough. My Sicilian takes seven days. Wow. So when people say, oh, $20 for a six by six, and then they taste it, they're coming back to the pop-up in the next week. You you get what you what you yeah. pay for. The passion and the love you put into your pizza will translate to your customers. So in two years' time, um, I will have a wood-fired pizzeria open, uh, hopefully within the five boroughs of New York, if not just outside of it. Because um, I think about the idea of bringing pizza to a place that might not have good pizza or might need that spark of magic. I can't wait. Yeah. I, so. <laughs> uh, I will be... First in line, or we'll try to be first in line yeah. on on day one. Um, this has been so insightful, and I think you, just your passion and your thoughtfulness to the the craft, uh, the business, uh, and the business model, and the industry is uh, is unmatched. And I've uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation and learned so much in uh, in a short amount of time. Oh, so thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I guess I'll end with advice to any other people that are baking pizza at home and going for their dreams is that uh, whatever bumps you may encounter along the way, embrace them, learn from them, and remember to just always be kind to people on the street and in your life, even if you don't know them, because one kind gesture could completely change someone's life for the better. Amen. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Yeah.